Our gospel reading for this morning is from the 25th chapter of Matthew. This is from a final set of teachings which includes four parables with this the next to the last, uh, where Jesus is instructing his disciples just prior to his arrest. These parables in some way seem to be addressed to Matthew's congregation, a congregation that is wondering about what it is to do in the unexpectedly long absence of Jesus following his resurrection. This gospel is probably written fairly late into the first century. And Matthew's Gentile uh, congregation, I mean, sorry, his Jewish congregation is tempted to go underground with their faith, to hide it so that they'll stay in the synagogue and not get kicked out their their worship home. So in some ways, this is addressed to folks different from us, but hopefully we can hear it as well. It's important to remember that in the parable, a talent has no connotation of human gifts. It, at the time of this parable, meant absolutely nothing other than a very, very, very large sum of money. So let us listen to what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. For it as is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward also, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've ever explored the buildings here at Falls Church Presbyterian, you've no doubt recognized that there have been more than a few additions and renovations over the years. 
the very back section of the sanctuary and the narthex on the other side and the steeple out there are part of the original construction from back in the 1880s. But since then, there's been a lot of adding ons and uh, extensions and renovations. The last being the fellowship hall and kitchen and the classrooms underneath that were built less than 15 years ago. When any congregation, this one included, does a renovation or a building program, there's always a certain amount of stepping out on faith. There's questions about whether or not the, the giving will be enough to pay off the mortgage. Will the hope for growth materialize? Prior to seminary, I served on the session of a church that decided to build a new sanctuary. Now it's perfectly clear that was a great decision. But at the time, it was a difficult one. There were many who were worried about the tremendous cost and the amount of risk that the congregation was taking on, not to mention the worries about how growth might change the character of the congregation. Now, I was never here for any of those discussions about whether to build or renovate, although I was here for the discussion about whether to hire a full-time youth director. Now, that's not permanent like a building, but it is it was a discussion about investing in the future, trusting that the money would be there if we moved forward. When you are part of a church, unless it's one that's just brand spanking new, you are in some ways the recipients of treasure bequeathed to you by those who went before you. The structures, music program, children's programs, Christmas Eve and Easter traditions, and on and on, were handed to us. And that means that most churches have to make decisions about how to care for that treasure they've inherited and how to utilize it well. But it turns out that Decisions about how to utilize the treasure can sometimes run afoul of the desire to care for and protect it. In the first church that I served as a pastor, the mission committee there wanted to find some sort of significant ongoing project that would utilize a large number of volunteers on a, on a recurring basis. And such an opportunity literally almost fell into our lap. There was a homeless ministry, a local homeless ministry, that was building a new day center not far from the church. And this was going to allow them a greater capacity to handle more homeless families, was a ministry towards homeless families. And so they were looking for additional churches who would serve as host, taking in five families for a week at a time over several different weeks throughout the year. And it was quite a system. In the afternoon, a truck, right after worship, a truck would show up in the church parking lot filled with beds and mattresses that had been taken out of another church early that morning. Volunteers would convert classrooms into bedrooms for families who would arrive later that evening and would leave the next morning and every morning around seven o'clock. There would be supper provided and breakfast and bag lunches as well for people during the day. And then the following Sunday, volunteers would turn bedrooms back into classrooms, 
put the beds back on the truck, which later that afternoon would make its way to another congregation and the process would start all over again. And it seemed a perfect fit for us. We had a number of classrooms that were not used during the week. The, the day center was less than a mile from, from us and it would make transportation issues easy to manage between there and back. It was just a sort of large-scale volunteer opportunity the mission committee was looking for. There were need for people to set up, to tear back down, to serve as host every evening, to cook supper, to prepare bag lunches, to spend the night, to tutor children, and so on. And so the mission committee took a recommendation to the session saying we want us to become an interfaith hospitality network congregation. Now, this recommend, recommendation was received as a great opportunity by many, but not by everyone. Some were worried about the wear and tear on the buildings. Some were concerned about the risk we were taking in having families with children, none of whom we knew, using our rooms, our building, our kitchen as their home for a week. And for some, the desire to take care of that treasure bequeathed to us meant this was simply too great a risk. Take. Now, in that parable we heard Jesus tell just a little while ago, three individuals are given treasure, a great amount of it. To the original hearers of Jesus' parable, Talent had no connotation of gifts or abilities. It was simply a large amount of money. It took 15 years of hard labor for a worker in Jesus' day to earn a single talent. Now suppose that you're a person of modest means and your boss says, hey, here's a couple million dollars. I want you to manage it for me while I sail around the world, what would you do with it? And, and what if your boss was a pretty demanding guy who did not take very well to people losing the company's money or his money? How much risk would you be willing to take? Now, if you're thinking you would choose oh, CDs or pretty low-risk mutual funds, maybe some other vehicle that you were reasonably certain couldn't lose the principal, then you made a choice pretty much the same as the third slave in this parable. See, there were no banks as we know them in Jesus' day. There were certainly no banking regulations. The law of Moses prohibited Jews from lending money at interest. And so the bankers in the parable would have been seen as the most unscrupulous sort of folks that you didn't want to deal with. And, and so burying money in the ground was considered by most people a perfectly respectable way of caring for large amounts of money that you didn't want to get lost. And then there's the earnings of the first two slaves. I'm sure they were hard workers, industrious. But I have to think that doubling your money required some substantial risk-taking on their part. And I wonder if those original hearers of this parable weren't inclined to identify with the third slave. You 
You know, we church folks are some of the most risk-averse people around. And I guess a certain amount of that is, is prudence. But at some point, it easily becomes a focus on preserving what we have been given, on protecting our treasure, and that easily becomes fear. Fear of what might go wrong. Fear of what we could lose. The very sort of fear that this parable condemns in the harshest terms. Now fortunately for that first congregation I served, people listened for the voice of the Spirit calling that church to use its treasure, to put its treasure to work for Jesus and for the kingdom. And that homeless ministry became a, a really central part of who that congregation was. Not unlike the way Welcome Table has become here. We here at FCPC have been entrusted with a tremendous treasure that includes our wonderful facilities, our great programs, our traditions, and so on. It includes the community we live in, the, the country that we live in. And most of all, it includes the treasure of the gospel. God's love in Christ. God's desire that everyone experience love and acceptance and wholeness and renewal as beloved children, regardless of who they are. In God's great generosity, we have been entrusted with all this treasure. What will we do with it? All praise and glory to the God who comes to us in Christ, giving all for us and calling us to new life as disciples of the risen one. Thanks be to God.